All right, folks, please open up to Philippians 2.19. We're going to be studying verses 19 to 24. And the title of the message today is Timothy, colon, a Christ-centered life. There it is. Timothy, a Christ-centered life. Last week it was Paul, a poured-out life. Today, Timothy, a Christ-centered life. Let's just go to the Lord. Father, all is vain unless you show up, unless you are ministering to the hearts of your people. Lord, I stand here in vain opening my mouth unless you are the teacher, unless, Lord, you can somehow speak to these faltering lips and somehow communicate truth through me. I, I pray that you'd do that, Lord. I pray that you'd help your people, Lord, to separate anything that is of my flesh from your spirit. Lord, that you'd give them discerning minds and hearts to see what your word says and to take from it what will be helpful and true and right and good and noble, that their lives would be built up in Christ today. So please do that work. May the Holy Spirit be working and ministering today through the word of God, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's go ahead and let's take a look at our text. Philippians chapter 2, verse 19 to 24. Paul writes, But I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, so that I also may be encouraged when I learn of your condition. For I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. For they all seek after their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus. But you know of his proven worth, that he served with me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father. Therefore, I hope to send him immediately as soon as I see how things go with me. And I trust in the Lord that I myself also will be coming shortly. Now in Philippians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul has been exhorting the church to selfless, humble service. He's been exhorting and urging the church to have this mind in them which was also in Christ Jesus. He's told them in verse 3 not to do anything from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind to regard one another as more important than themselves. And not only uh, to not merely look out for their own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. And then what Paul did in order to help buttress that exhortation was to give some examples, flesh and blood examples of people that actually put that into practice. And the very first one he gives is the Lord Jesus Christ, which is the greatest example that can ever be given. So he points to Jesus as the ultimate example of a selfless, humble servant who came from the highest high, right? The, the, the glories of heaven where he was worshipped by innumerable angels and spirits of just men made perfect. And instead of retaining that worship and that glory, he was willing to empty himself and come down into this fallen, broken world and be found as a man and be made in the likeness of sinners, except he was never a sinner himself, but he was like people, like ordinary people, you and me. And then not only that, but then he humbled himself still further and he died, not any death, but the most shameful death, the death of the cross. So Jesus is the great example of humility, of sacrificial service on behalf of his people. The problem, of course, when we look at the example of Jesus is that we say, well, I'm not Jesus. I'm not God. I'm, I'm not divine. I have a sinful nature and he didn't. I can't really relate with Jesus because I'm, I'm not in his league. He's totally out of my league. And all that's true. Uh, it's true that we should look to him as our example, but it's also true that we instinctively feel we don't, we don't really relate. And so Paul goes further and he starts to give three other examples, not divine examples like Jesus, but regular ordinary human beings like you and me. He, he gives his own example in verse 17 and 18 of how he poured out his life for the church day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year until he finally poured out the final few drops. He, he describes his life as a drink offering, which was that 
libation or this sacrifice of wine that was poured out either on the animal sacrifice or right next to it and it was to top it off or to complete that animal sacrifice and so he looks to the Philippians lives as sacrifices to God and he says I just want to complete you I want to top off what you're doing in terms of giving your life to Jesus Christ but that brings us to the second regular ordinary human model of humble selfless service and this time it's not Paul it's Timothy and then when I come back next time to teach we'll talk about Epaphroditus but today it's Timothy beginning in verse 19 and Timothy's whole, whole life was a Christ centered life he was consumed with the interests of Jesus Christ and that's what makes him unique and special and, and different when we look at him Paul wanted to send Timothy to the church in Philippi and it wasn't because Paul didn't want to go himself he did but he couldn't he was a prisoner in Rome while he's writing this letter his hands are chained to a guard he's under house arrest so he can't leave and come and so he sends someone in his place that can minister to the Philippian church on his behalf and we know that Paul would have come if he could because back in chapter 1 verse 7 he said I have you in my heart and in chapter 1 verse 8 he says God is my witness how I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus and in chapter 4 verse 1 he says therefore my beloved brethren whom I long to see my joy and crown so he said I long to see you I have you in my heart I have this affection of Christ Jesus in my heart for you so Paul would have come if at all possible but he can't so the next best thing he can do is send somebody in his place sort of his own representative that will come and and minister to the, the Philippian church and hopefully bring Paul back good news of how they're standing firm in the Lord so before we dive into this let me just give some details about this man Timothy Timothy grew up either in Lystra or Derby, which are smaller villages of the region of Galatia we don't know exactly how or when he was converted he may have been converted through Paul's first missionary journey because Paul went through those regions on his first missionary tour he came back again on his second tour and when he came back into uh, Lystra and Derby he saw a disciple a certain disciple named Timothy and Paul wanted him to join him on his travels so he had been converted earlier he was well spoken of by the brethren in his hometown meaning that he, he had a reputation for godliness and for seriousness when it came to the things of God Paul saw that in him and decided that he wanted him to attend him be his assistant his sort of his protege his helper as as he went about preaching the gospel and establishing churches and so he asked Timothy to come along now Timothy had a Jewish mother named Eunice and a Jewish grandmother named Lois and a Greek speaking father so his mother and his grandmother had taught him the scriptures his his Greek father would have educated him in Greek culture Greek thought all of that so he had these two sides to him his father taught him one one set of things and his mother and his grandmother taught him another set of things but Paul knew because he had a Greek father that he it would be necessary to have him circumcised so that there would be nothing to limit his ministry amongst Jewish people if he was uncircumcised then the Jews would never listen to him and so Paul went ahead and had him circumcised took him along with him and Paul, Paul called him by several titles in the Bible in 1st Timothy 1 verse 2 he calls him my true child in the faith in 2nd Timothy 1 2 he calls him my beloved son in Romans 16 21 he calls him my fellow worker in 2nd Corinthians 1 1 he calls him our brother in 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 2 he calls him God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ so there's all these endearing titles that Paul uses to refer to him his true child his beloved son his fellow worker his brother his God's fellow worker in the gospel 
So you see there was a real close relationship between Paul and Timothy. Almost like a father-son relationship. And Timothy was with Paul when Paul was in Philippi. In fact, when Paul planted the church in Acts chapter 16, Timothy was there. So the Philippian believers knew Paul just as long as they, or Timothy, they knew Timothy just as long as they'd known Paul. They were just as familiar with him because he was there from the very beginning. So he was there with Paul in Philippi, Berea, Thessalonica, Corinth, and he's now with Paul in Rome as Paul's imprisoned there. In fact, Timothy himself had, had spent time in prison at one point because in Hebrews 13, 23, the writer says, Take notice that our brother Timothy has been released, with whom, if he comes, I will see, I will see you. So not only was Paul imprisoned several times, but Timothy also for the cause of Jesus Christ. And oftentimes when Paul would write letters to the churches, he would mention Timothy as, he would say, Paul and Timothy to the church at so-and-so. And he did that in the epistles of 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 2nd Corinthians, Colossians, and Philippians. So several times he was sort of a co-author of these letters. Now what's the historical situation? Let's just recreate what's going on here. Remember, Paul is in Rome, Timothy is in Rome with Paul. Paul's imprisoned, he wants to go to the Philippians, he can't, so he's going to send Timothy in his place. He says in Philippians 2.19, But I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, so that I also may be encouraged when I learn of your condition. Notice how Paul states his hope. I hope to send Timothy to you shortly, and then in verse 23 he says, I hope to send him immediately, so very, very soon. But he, he, he phrases that in verse 19, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly. And what do you mean by that? I hope in the Lord Jesus. I think what Paul is saying is, I hope, but my hope is submitted to the sovereignty of Jesus Christ in this situation. I don't know Christ's will and Christ's plans. This is what I want, and I'm hoping that that'll happen, but it's, I'm submitted and I'm resigned to the will of Christ. It's His will that ultimately will prevail here. Now why does Paul want to send Timothy to the Philippians? Look at verse 19. He says, so that I also may be encouraged when I learn of your condition. Paul says, I want to send him because I want to be encouraged. Now of course, he wanted the Philippians to be encouraged. And no doubt they would be when Timothy came to them. But he says, ultimately, I'm sending him because I want to be encouraged. You see, Paul was really optimistic about the Philippians. He didn't expect to receive a bad report of how they were doing spiritually. He expected to receive a good report that would encourage his heart. So he's optimistic about them. This got me thinking about, can you, can you imagine living in a time like this when it was so difficult to communicate with other people that weren't right in your own little village or town. Paul is in Rome and he's sending Timothy to Philippi. That was about an 800 mile journey. Now today, no big deal. Get on a plane and you get there in one and a half or two hours, right? Um, or you, if you want to get in your car. And if you want to drive for 12 or 13 hours, you can make it in a day. But in these days, you can't go faster than four or five miles an hour. You're walking, or you're in a ship, or you're, maybe you're riding a donkey or a camel, but you're not going over four or five miles an hour. So it's going to take you seven weeks just to make that 800 mile journey. And then it's seven weeks back. So let's say Paul wants to send them a letter, and then he wants to hear back. You're talking at least three months, if not further, just to get, <laughs> just send your letter and get an answer back. It reminds me here in America, you know, before the trains existed, at least you had the Pony Express back then. You know, you'd, someone would ride their ponies 25 miles an hour on a, on a horse, and then they'd change horses and keep going. And that was really a smart, uh, inventive, imaginative way of communication that they had developed. And then the Morse code was developed. But before any of that, it was the exact same way in the 1700s here in America. Communication was extremely slow. 
and makes me thankful for things like telephones and emails and texting and Zoom and FaceTime and all those awesome ways that we can communicate so easily and quickly today. So not only did Paul want to send Timothy to them, but he has a really strong hope that he's going to be able to come soon. And he even tells him that in verse 23. Therefore I hope to send him immediately, as soon as I see how things go with me, and I trust in the Lord that I myself also will be coming shortly. So Paul's in prison. He doesn't expect to be executed at this time in his life. Because he says here, I... I trust in the Lord that I myself also will be coming. Now, he wasn't absolutely sure about that. He doesn't know the will of God. It could be that he would die for his faith at this time. Turns out that he didn't. He was released, and he ended up serving the Lord for years longer. He eventually ended up back in Rome and was, according to tradition, beheaded under um, Caesar Nero's reign. But at this time, he says, I want to come, and I expect to be able to. I'm not absolutely sure, but I'm trusting in the Lord that I'll be able to do that. And then, in chapter 1, verse 25, he says, Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. So, he has this hope, this trust, this desire, and actually God did work it out so that he could be with them another time. Now, that gives us some of the history behind what's happening. What I want to spend the rest of our time doing this morning is to try to help you see Timothy's character that is a model for us and an inspiration for us serving the Lord 2,000 years later. And I want to show you three things about his character that I hope will encourage and inspire you to serve the Lord. Number one, Timothy showed genuine concern for others. Two, Timothy sought the interests of Christ. And three, Timothy served to further the gospel. We see those three things in his life. Let's look at each one of them. First of all, Timothy showed genuine concern for others. That's in verse 20. Paul says, For I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. I have no one else that I can send to you that I know will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. He goes on to say, they all seek after their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus. Now on the surface, isn't that a, a sad statement that Paul would make this kind of a statement well, you know, years and years after he'd begun to plant churches and make disciples? This is in the, probably the early 60s, and Paul was converted many years before. And he says, I have no one else that I can send to you that will genuinely be concerned for your interests. Now, wait a minute. Paul's in Rome, and when he wrote the book of Romans, he sends greetings to dozens of people in the 16th chapter. Wouldn't any of those people be genuinely concerned for the interests of the Philippian believers? Couldn't he send any of them? He mentions a whole bunch of people there, and he greets them in the Lord. Evidently not. What about Luke? What about Aristarchus and some of these other people that were with Paul there in Rome when he was in prison? Perhaps, uh, perhaps they had gone on various journeys and they weren't around. Paul couldn't send them at that time. It just tells me, sometimes we, we hold up the early church as this awesome example of super spirituality, you know, and these guys don't have the same problems we do. Wait a minute. They have the same problems we do. They, they were sinful. They were selfish. They were self-centered. They were concerned about themselves and not the interests of Christ. Sad to say. And so, we shouldn't have this false idea that the early church was so far more spiritual than us. They dealt with the same problems of the human heart that we do. But the beautiful thing in this verse is to see that there was one man that would have the interests of the church in Philippi on his heart. He would be genuinely concerned for them and not himself. And that man was Timothy. Now, the word concerned here, verse 20, 
who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. That word for concern is the very same word Paul uses over in chapter 4 verse 6 when he says be anxious for nothing. The word is anxious. I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be anxious for your welfare. That's the idea. Who will have this burden for your welfare. In other words, Timothy really cared about these people. Timothy wanted them to be well and thriving spiritually and happy in the Lord and prospering in the Lord. He was concerned about them and their growth and their, their joy in Christ. He wasn't coming because he wanted to get something from them. He wanted to pour his life into them. We find the same idea in 1 Corinthians 4.16. I'm going to read that to you. It's 1 Corinthians 4.16 and 17. Therefore I exhort you, be imitators of me. For this reason, for the reason that I want you to be imitators of me, I have sent to you Timothy, who is my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, and he will remind you of my ways, which are in Christ, just as I teach everywhere in every church. So did you see that? Paul says, I want you to be imitators of me, and since I can't come to you, I'm going to send to you Timothy, because Timothy will teach you everything that I would teach you if I were there. He knows what I teach. He knows what I teach in everywhere in every church. He's heard me dozens of times teach and preach and unfold the gospel to Christians. So Timothy knows everything I'm going to teach and he'll teach you in my place. So it's almost like Paul sending a, a carbon copy of himself when he sends Timothy. Paul was genuinely concerned for the interests of the Philippians. He couldn't find anybody else to send in his place that would be genuinely concerned for them except for Timothy and so he's the one that he sent. This tells me that one of the traits, the character traits that we should really seek to develop by God's grace is this trait of being genuinely concerned for other people. We, don't you find it that you have a struggle with that because we, if we can, self-absorption can just wrap us up thinking all about our problems and what we need and what we want and not really think about other people. It's human nature, right? That's a result of the fall. I don't think this was part of uh, Adam and Eve before the fall, but I think afterwards, as a result of the fall, we are totally self-absorbed and wrapped up in ourselves. May God free us from that so that we can truly be concerned for others. You know, 1 John 3.16, John says we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So, are you a Christian? Our duty then is to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters in Christ. That's a lot more serious than just thinking about them once in a while. Laying down your life, your interests, your desires, putting those aside and saying, Lord, their welfare is really what I want to seek. So that's the first thing that we can see about Timothy. He was genuinely concerned for the interests of others. May God help us to be the same. The second thing we see about him is that he sought the interests of Christ. Look at verse 21. For they all seek after their own interests not those of Christ Jesus. In other words, Timothy's not like all these other people who are only seeking after their own interests. They're not seeking after the interests of Christ, but Timothy does. He seeks after the interests of Jesus Christ. Remember Paul's exhortation back in chapter 2 verse 4? Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. So he's exhorting them not to just look out for their own personal interest. And then he says, I don't have anybody else I can send you that's not seeking after their own interest. <laughs> so Timothy was known as a Christ-centered believer. He, he was concerned about the interests of Jesus. What was it that Jesus wanted? Well, that's what Timothy wanted. Remember the Lord's Prayer 
Timothy could truly pray the first half of the Lord's Prayer sincerely. Our Father, who art in heaven, here's the first one, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. So Jesus teaches us when we go to pray, to pray for God's name, God's kingdom, and God's will. He doesn't teach you, first of all, to pray all about your name, or your kingdom, or your will. He says what should preeminently be concerning to you when you go to your father to pray is God's name, the fame of God's name, the glory of his name, his kingdom, extending his kingdom in the earth. And then his will, not yours, but what does God want from my life? So, the burning question in Timothy's mind must have been, how can I further the interests of my master? Lord, what is it that you want? What are your interests? I'm all about that, Lord. Send me. I'm willing to go anywhere you want, Lord. What are your interests in the world? I want to be used of you. Now, he talks here in verse 21 about the interests of Jesus Christ. What would that be? What are the interests of Christ Jesus? As I thought of that, I, I thought, well, I think I can boil that down to a pretty simple three parts. I think that would include the glory of God, that's the interests of Christ Jesus, God's glory, the salvation of His people, and the sanctification of His saints. God's glory, salvation of sinners, sanctification of the church. And just as Jesus was consumed with the interests of His Father, we are called to be consumed with the interests of Jesus. Notice Jesus Christ in His words. I'm going to share a few verses that show us what Jesus was concerned about. This is John 2.17. Zeal for your house, God's house, will consume me. The King James says, well, eat, it has eaten me up. Zeal for thine house has eaten me up. It's consumed me. So what was the interest of Christ when he was on the earth? God's house. His house would be, at that time, would be uh, the worship of God that would, was carried on in the temple. Jesus said, that has eaten me up. And that's why he drove the money changers out of the temple. Because he wanted purity of worship to go to his father. It consumed him. Or John 4.34 My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. So Jesus' food was to do God's will. It, that's what gave him strength and nourishment was to do the will of God. It, it energized him to do the will of God. Or John 17.4 He said, I glorified you on the earth having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. That's what he was consumed with. That's what his mind was set on. Accomplishing the work that the Father had given him to do. Or John 5 verse 30. I can do nothing on my own initiative. As I hear I judge. And my judgment is just. Because I do not seek my own will. But the will of him who sent me. Now. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could put. ourselves in that verse. And we could say that about ourselves. I do not seek my own will, but I seek the will of him who sent me. So that's what it comes down to, brothers and sisters. It comes down to, do we truly want to do the will of God in all things in our life? And are we conscious of when we come to a decision or to a situation in our life to be asking the Lord, what is your will in this situation? What is it that you want? You know, we can do so many things without even asking that question. Just making decisions like this and not even considering whether what we're about to do is the will of God. So we need to slow down and start meditating on the will of God. And we find His will in His Word. Amen. That's why we have to be in the Word constantly. Now, not only was Jesus consumed with the will of God, but so was the Apostle Paul. Back in Philippians 1.21, he said, For to, for to me, to live is Christ. For to me, to live is Christ. Christ was his all-consuming passion. He said in Acts 20, verse 24, But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself. 
so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. So I don't consider my life of any account as dear to myself. And I'm not trying to hold on to this life. What I'm really concerned with is to finish my course. And what he's talking about that is a race course. He looked at his life as being on a, on a race, on a particular course that God had laid out for him. And I want to finish it, he says. Not only that, I want to finish the ministry which Jesus gave to me. And that ministry was to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. That was what Paul was passionate about. He wanted to finish the ministry and the course God laid out for him. Is that true about you? Are you passionate about finishing your course? That is the will of God for your life. And that, like I was saying last week, that, yeah, it was last week, that's going to be different for each of us, a little bit different. A wife's course is a, different from a husband's course, which is different from a child's course. Or a, uh, an, an owner of a company, that his course is going to be a little different from an employee in a company's course. God has a different way that he wants us to run, to live out this Christian life. Paul also would say often at the beginning of his letters when he introduced himself he would, he would say a bondservant of Jesus Christ. A bondservant. What do you mean? A bondservant was someone who was seeking to do his master's will and he was seeking his master's interests above everything else. So I'd like you just to take a minute and contemplate this right now. God has given us the example of Timothy to inspire us, to motivate us to greater godliness in our lives. How do you feel like you're actually doing when it comes to not seeking your own interests, but seeking the interests of Christ? How's that going? Is the Holy Spirit putting anything in front of your mind right now where he's saying, well, you're really not doing that in this area? If he is, then that's something, make a note of that, write that down, begin to take that to the Lord in prayer, repent of seeking your own interests rather than Christ's interests, lay that out before the Lord and ask him for the grace of the Spirit of God that you would change that, change that direction. So seeking the interest of Jesus Christ is seeking His name, His kingdom, His will, God's glory, God's people, the sanctification of God's church. Let's look at the third one, the third characteristic there. Timothy served to further the gospel. He was a servant and his mission as a servant was the furtherance of the gospel. And that comes out in verse 22. Paul says, but you know of his proven worth that he served with me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father. Now Paul says, he served with me. So, from Paul's perspective, Timothy served with him. But from Timothy's perspective, he was serving Paul like a child serves his father. But I like Paul's humility. Paul didn't look down on Timothy as sort of Timothy's Lord or boss or dictator. No, he says we're equals. We're, we're co-servants. We're serving together in the furtherance of the gospel. But from Timothy's perspective, he looked up to Paul as sort of a father figure in the faith. And he was submitted to Paul. And Paul was an apostle. Timothy was not. Paul had submitted himself to his, the spiritual leadership of the apostle Paul. That's one of the things you find about Timothy. Uh, you, you never read about Timothy chafing against Paul's authority. You never read of Timothy um, sharply disagreeing with Paul like Barnabas did. They had a very sharp disagreement. We don't read about that. What you do read about is Paul sending Timothy here or there or the other place and Timothy always going. <laughs> he was just like, he's totally available. To, to go wherever Paul needed him to go. It's like he had given up a will of his own. And he was just available to do the will of God 
And that will of God was expressed through the apostle in his life. And Paul would send him. He would go to Ephesus. He would go to Philippi. He would go to Corinth. And wherever Paul needed him, he, he would just take off. It's a rare, rare person who has that kind of a heart. Just to be totally available to do whatever God wants him to do. He was a valuable individual to Paul. He had the same heart towards the church that Paul did. He knew all of Paul's teaching. And he could, he could reteach <laughs> the same stuff to the church. He would go wherever he was needed. He, it seemed like he had crucified his own desires and put the furtherance of the gospel above everything else. Now that is really, really commendable. Sometimes we'll read about missionaries that will do that. Right? They, they'll just lay down any desires of their own and say, I'm willing to just to set that aside. And Lord, what would you have me to do? For example, we never read in Timothy's life about him falling in love and getting married or having children. As far as we know, he was single and celibate his entire life. We never read about him owning a home or settling down in one place. He's constantly traveling from place to place. He seems like he's tirelessly, uh, he, he's mobile, always on the go, always headed one place or another. The Apostle Paul, it's estimated, traveled over 10,000 miles in his life. And Timothy, I'm sure, was not far behind him because Timothy's traveling just like Paul is, all over the place. And this is at a day and age when I said before, you're going about four or five miles an hour. 10,000 miles is a long, long ways to go. So his whole life was wrapped up in traveling to wherever God needed him to be in that particular time. He was tireless in his service to promote, to spread, and to teach the gospel of Jesus Christ. How many Christians can we point to who are meek and humble and submissive and obedient to a fault. I mean, I'm sure Timothy had his faults, but we really don't read about them. Maybe one fault was that he was kind of timid. We read about his timidity. But in, in, in terms of his willingness to do whatever God required of him, it seems like it was there. He was just a willing servant. So let's, let's draw this message to a conclusion. What does the Holy Spirit want to do in your life? from this word this morning. I believe he's desiring to inspire you and me to greater acts of humble selfless service. That's why it was put here. God wants us to be humble and he wants us to be selfless and he wants us to be servants. He wants us to be genuinely concerned for others. Is that true? Or do we get wrapped up in ourselves far too easily? Maybe this week, one of the top prayer requests that we can be praying is, Lord, help me to be genuinely concerned for others and to be thinking about them. When you go to pray, instead of thinking about your own needs right off the bat, try to think of the, the needs of other people that you know. What are their needs? And begin to pray for them first before your own needs. So genuinely concerned for others. Be thinking about how you can lay down your life for others. That is actually a command in scripture. Truly care about the well-being of your brothers and sisters. Look around the room at the people here. You know of the different struggles that some people have, right? We're a small enough church that we really, it, it's pretty hard to, to hide <laughs> some of our struggles because we get to know each other. Well, if you do, pray. And then if God gives you an idea of how you can minister to somebody, follow up on it. Act on that. Maybe it's a phone call, a text. Maybe it's saying, hey, can we get together this week? Whatever that is, act on that thing. Secondly, as we've seen, God wants us to be seeking the interests of Christ Jesus. When someone looks at your life, do they see someone who's wrapped up in the glory and the fame of the name of Christ? Who's seeking his kingdom? Who's seeking his will? Who's seeking the salvation of the lost and the sanctification of the church? That really should be what 
what our lives are marked by. The interests of Christ. And then thirdly, are you a servant to further the gospel? Now what would it look like if somebody was involved in serving to further the gospel? Well, I think it would, be, it would look like someone who makes an effort to actually tell others about Christ and salvation through Him. Is that happening? I know some of you, and I think this is awesome, just take tracks with you and you leave them at places or you hand them out. We were able to hand out a couple yesterday, which is really cool to some people. That's one way, going out as a church together and engaging people. I love this new spiritual belief survey that we're using. I think it's so easy for anyone to be able to share their faith using this tool. It's an awesome tool. But God wants us to be involved somehow in, in spreading the gospel of Christ. That's what he says here. Timothy was a servant. He served with me in the furtherance of the gospel. Just like a child that serves his father. Maybe it also looks like you setting some finances aside every month to make sure that they go into the work of getting the gospel to unreached people groups. People around the globe, not just here in Sacramento, but in places where they don't have churches. I recently, recently on one of our Zoom Bible studies, uh, we were talking to Pastor Ray, and if I understood him correctly, he was saying that they're, they've started a church in a place where there are no other Christian churches. Like through him, we've, sent, we've gotten to know a person who's actually doing this. An unreached people group in his, his part of the world, Bangladesh, which I just think is beautiful. It's awesome. And I know that's happening in Vietnam. Churches are being planted where there are no Christian churches. So brothers and sisters, let's recommit ourselves today that we would be genuinely concerned about others, that we would seek the interests of Jesus Christ, and that we would serve to further his gospel in the world. That's what he's calling us to do. Let's pray. Lord, please, this morning, please put your finger on areas of our life where we're woefully falling short of these high ideals that we see in the life of Timothy. Thank you for the example in Scripture. And we pray that it would motivate us to, to real action, to real change, that, Lord, you would give us the grace to repent of not seeking the interests of Christ or not really being concerned about others, only concerned about ourselves, Lord, or not really being involved in the furtherance of the gospel. Please work in us, Lord, to will and to do of your good pleasure. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.